Support for this podcast is provided by Subtruck Law. Revolution Recap thanks Subtruck Law for their support of our show, local independent media, and their mission of bringing unbiased truth. Revolution Recap would also like to thank Six Point Builders for their support. Six Point Builders are builders of fine custom homes in the Boston metropolitan area. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Revolution Recap. The top two teams in the East had a much-anticipated battle and lived up to the hype. A 1-1 draw between FC Cincinnati and the New England Revolution in a rainy Gillette Stadium on Saturday night. Some excellent play, great chances, questionable refereeing. This match had everything you want from Major League Soccer and more. Probably the match of the year so far in this young Revolution season. Uh, Certainly a very, very entertaining game. And I think the Revolution probably feel like they could have come away with the three points. They look like the stronger of the two teams on the night, but instead they will come away with a single point. I'm Greg Johnstone. Joining me tonight is Sean Donahue. Sean, how are you? I'm good. You know, I I was a bit tired today heading into this game, but the game made sure to wake me up. So I'm glad we had an exciting one to talk about, Uh, because if it was a zero zero snooze fest, I'm not sure I'd be uh, too too good shape right now. Yeah, and, and until uh, probably like five minutes before the game, I was preparing to do this podcast solo, so you're stepping in last minute, so uh, wanted to thank you for that. And, you know, we haven't had a Greg and Sean episode in a while, and that means we haven't done one of our most popular segments, Tottenham 20, where I let you talk about Spurs for 20 seconds. I think Tottenham 20 is a very fitting name since 20 minutes is the amount of time it takes Tottenham to concede five times. Uh, Sean, do you, do you want to talk about Spurs real quick? I think I'll skip this time. I'll, I'll uh, seed my time. I thought maybe you'd be uh, able to pivot into Arsenal choking at home uh, to Manchester City, but uh, this this, uh, this season has just been too depressing for me to uh, discuss. <laughs> well, let's hop into Major League Soccer, the best league in the world, uh, and let's hop into our key takeaways. And these are brought to you by our friends over at the Rebellion. Go to anyrebellion.org to learn more about their organization and how you can get involved in supporter culture. Sean, what's your key takeaway from tonight? Just that the Revolution are a really good team. Um, there's so much that could could have gone wrong tonight. They lost Barrero in the 21st minute. They conceded an early goal. Uh, the set-piece defending is, is problematic. <laughs> That's a conversation for another time, but this, the set-piece defending is problematic. But the Revolution bounced back from that. And, you know, bad potentially bad penalty kick call we'll get into. Uh, they still they fought back. They got an equalizer in stoppage time and were the better team for the second half. And I think we're unlucky not to come away with a win here. Uh, but considering Giacomo Veroni was out, considering Gustavo Bo was only able to play 20-some-odd minutes, Bobby Wood only able to play 20-some-odd minutes, uh, they had to start Justin Rennick's up top They because of lack of options, which is Bruce Arena basically said after the game when asked why Justin Rennick started. He said he you know, played well on Tuesday, but also he was really the only option. Um, you know, this, this was a, a battle between the top two teams in the East Eastern Conference, two teams that have gotten off to a really, really good start. And the Revolution you know, didn't come out maybe the best, but they were able to pick it up and really look like the better team in this game, despite the fact that they had all those things working against them, uh, including Dylan Barrero's injury, including no Vrioni, which none of us knew was going to be the case until the game started, uh, and no Gustavo Bo and no Bobby Wood until late in the match. So this was a, a very good performance from the Revolution that I think tells us a lot and just shows us just how good they are. You know, Again, and other things I would add too, the, the rain in this match, made it a sloppy game but the revolution still found a way to to take advantage and win this one and uh, or get the draw on this one and you talk about emmanuel boateng and what he's done for the revolution this past week uh, what a performance from him too getting the start getting that goal and, and probably could have had two or three goals with the opportunities and the places he put himself and uh, just showing the depth of the team this year when, when guys have been out hurt yeah i, I want to talk about boateng real fast just because i thought he had a phenomenal game and sean i think our opinion on boateng is this is a guy you want in late in the game this is a guy you want running at tired legs. This is a great 25, 30 minute player to the point where if it's a tie game and it's the 60th minute when Ima Boateng's not coming in, I think we both get a little bit annoyed. Um, but we never really thought of him, or at least I didn't think of him as a 90 minute player. But I think he's changing some minds here between 
um, his, his game in the U.S. Open Cup, uh, his game tonight, he was very dangerous for 90 minutes. Um, he really came at FC Cincinnati uh, this entire game. Um, he obviously scored the goal from Brandon Bay. Uh, he had a double chance there at the end of the first half. Uh, he had a cross to Esmir, which looks like it was deflected, and Esmir got a little bit under it. He skied it over the bar. That was at the end of the first half. He had a dangerous cross in front of goal uh, early, early in the game. I think the 12th minute, but no one was there. But that was a perfectly placed ball. If there was a uh, striker there, I think Rennix was a little behind the play. He also had that chip over the bar when Noel Buck had a, a beautiful diagonal ball to him, and he kind of chips the ball over the goalkeeper. Was was a little, little too high. I, I don't know how much of a chance there was of that going in, but still creating kind of something out of nothing. Um, he seems to be on the right wavelength with Carlos Hill. He seems to be on the right wavelength with Dewan Jones. Even Noel Buck seemed like he had a really, really good um, – connection with Ima Botang. There was some good one, two quick passing on with Ima 39% of possession was down that left side, uh, according to Apple TV in the post game. Um, and it seemed like the left side was really dangerous. And that was because of Ima Botang. So with Dylan Pereiro out, which I'll talk about in my, a second, which is my key takeaway. Um, you know, I, I wonder if we see Ima Botang get more opportunities like this and we see him as a 90 minute player, because right now, if you're going to go with this four, two, three, one formation, Ema seems like the guy that is going to step up and be in that role. And I, I, again, I never really pictured him for this role, but tonight he proved he could handle it. Yeah. And we saw him get the start against Kansas city last weekend and the start today. And I, I think if, if Boateng is our Barrera rather is out for any extended period. And uh, unfortunately it sounds like he probably will be, uh, you know, Boateng has shown he can step up and make that starting role. I, I agree with you that, you know, going into the season, it seemed like Boateng has established himself as a really good super sub for the revolution. We weren't really sure that, you know, he was capable of being that 90 minute player, uh, but, but he's proven, you know, he didn't go 90 minutes against Kansas city he went 74, but still he's proven in those two starts that he's capable of starting a game and contributing a lot in this game. He was dangerous right up to the very end. So it, it's, it's a, it's a good sign for the revolution as they are dealing with so many injuries that Boateng now certainly looks capable of being a 90 minute player. And I think Bruce arena has to keep playing him 90 minutes the way he's playing right right now. Yes, yeah, sorry. Sporting Kansas City, not the U.S. Open Cup game. I'm getting my games mixed up. But uh, overall, Boateng, uh, 90 minutes plays. Obviously, he had the goal. Four total shots, 88% pass accuracy. He had 1.1 uh, expected goals. Uh, he was also two for four on ground duels, six recoveries, uh, four passes into the final third, uh, two for three on successful dribbles. Very, very solid night from him, Boateng, all the way around. I just want to give you a quick pass. I think you're thinking Sporting Kansas City was the Open Cup game because they look like a team that should be in the USL Championship. <laughs> we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Oh, who won between Sporting Kansas City and Montreal? I, 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 I need to Montreal check. was up two nothing last I checked. I don't, I don't know how it finished. I'm I, I, Montreal is very capable of blowing a two nothing lead, but, I, but I'm going to guess they pulled it off. Yeah, they did. If it, well, it's two nothing right now. Still, game game is still on. Yeah. Well. Um... Peter Vermees will be coaching in USL uh, sooner rather than later, I, I think. It seems like his time there is running out very, very quickly. So uh, let's get to let, – let's make this episode a little sad. Let's talk about Dylan Barrera. We've got to talk about it. Um, knees don't bend that way. Um, I'm not a doctor, but I've watched enough sports to know that looks like his season is done. I don't think I'm being controversial in saying that. If he is playing again this season – that would be a miracle in my mind. Just did not look good. Um, that was a, a very awkward landing. I don't even think that was a foul. I think that was just kind of a freak play where he comes down, he lands awkwardly on his left knee, and it seemed like immediately he knew. Um, taken off on a stretcher. Um, I, I would imagine this is an ACL injury and his, his 2023 is over. So it's going to be, even if the Revs won this game or if they lost this game, I think the story here is Dylan Barrero is probably out for a long time and we don't have confirmation from Bruce Arena but Bruce Arena did say that he believes it's a significant knee injury I think that was his words in the post-game press yeah, conference it looks it looks like a serious knee injury is what he said I, I agree with that statement and I think it was pretty obvious from seeing that first replay that when the knee lands that way it, it just isn't great um, and Gillette Stadium turf is not very forgiving so um, it's going to be interesting to see how the revolution adapt if they go with uh, Ima Boateng as a 90 minute player, um, do you go with a diamond and go Buck Blessing, Polster, Carlos Heel in the diamond uh, and use Esmir and uh, Jack P uh, in the diamond when you need uh, a substitution? Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how the revolution manage this because Dylan Barrero was looking out to be one of the top players on this team. And with Gustavo Bo not being 100% healthy, with Frioni having questions around him, 
we'll talk about Freoni a little bit later. And obviously he had the brace last weekend, so there's fewer questions. But with the top of the roster having so many questions, Dylan, Bre- Dylan Barrero breaking out into um, what they had hoped him to be was looking to be one of the top stories of 2023 and looked like he was um, going to have an amazing year and potentially make the all-star team. Um, that all seems to be completely gone. So it's going to be interesting how Bruce Arena manages the rest of the season going forward if they change formations because um, Barrero certainly was a piece that they are going to center th- themselves around. And while the Revs are holding on to the top spot right now, I really feel like this is reopening uh, the Eastern Conference. Why, right as we started talking about the Revs being a good team uh, and playing everyone well, I, I think losing a key player, truth be told, um, I-, I think their title chances took a big hit tonight. Yeah, I, I agree. I, it, it seemed like a very serious knee injury, like Bruce Arena said. It, if it's anything else, the Revs are, are very lucky, uh, but it, it doesn't it doesn't look good. And he's been such a key player for the Revolution this year. I mean, there is consistency issues, certainly, as Bruce Arena has talked about. But when he's at the top of his game, it, you know, he just adds another dimension to this Revolution attack. And, you know, Boateng, I think we talked about, is going to get more minutes. But what else the Revolution do is it's going to be a, a tough choice. Esmir, I thought, looked pretty good coming off the bench in this one. He's, he's starting to come into his own, so he might be a candidate to, to get more playing time. You know, I think the unknown timeline for when Nacho Hill is ever going to get healthy becomes probably more of a, something that people need to dig into now that Barrero is out. Um, Mac Tommy McNamara is a guy we haven't seen yet this season that we don't know exactly his timeline uh, so there are options there for Bruce Arena, but none of them are quite the dynamic player that Dylan Burrow is, and the Revolution attack is certainly going to miss him uh, this year if he is out for the rest of the season or any significant chunk, which which seems likely. Um, but it's it's going to be a very different Revolution attack without him out there, and the options are very wide and varied, but none of them have the dynamicism, the pace, the ability to dribble at guys and put in dangerous crosses the way Burrow can. Mm-hmm. Uh, Emily M actually asked us pretty directly, how do you think Bruce will handle uh, that going forward with Barrero, with Barrero seemingly out a while? How do you think Bruce will handle that going forward in terms of personnel formation and such? It, it's a tough guess. I think short term, Boateng is going to be the guy that steps in, but the primary transfer window just closed, so they're going to have to figure it out in-house. Um, there's really no one like Barrero on the roster that I can think of, I, I know Ima Boateng can kind of handle that left side, but I wonder if they go back to that diamond formation, like I said, and kind of just add Latif Blessing into the mix as well and, and keep Polster and Buck going in the lineup. I, I, yeah, I think for the short term, it's going to be what we saw finish this game, which is two forwards up top, Gustavo Bo, Bobby Wood. We don't, don't know how Rioni factors into that yet. He's been playing well. You need to get him minutes. Yeah, we just don't know if he can play with Gustavo Bo. That was a, you know, that was a topic for a previous episode. Uh, but I think you know, two guys up top. We think we see Boateng out on the wing. I see Carlos Heel as kind of the more floating guy. Um, Polster and Buck as their your two central mids behind them. And you know, Latif Blessing kind of rotating with those guys. And then... Uh, obviously nothing changed with the back line based on this injury, but I think I think what, we, what ended this game is going to be similar to what we see for the short term. It's, it's worked pretty well when they've done it. It worked pretty well in this game. So until that kind of fails, I, I don't think that Bruce switches up the formation to the diamond, although there is some appeal to that now with Burrow out and with trying to find places to get both Blessing and Buck on the field at the same time. Yeah, and I'll also say, I imagine Vrioni is going to start over Wood um, pending health. I think that's the big um, asterisk there where... Um, if Rioni is good to go, it seems like he's in the team's good graces and they're working him into the lineup and getting him more minutes. Um, I, I, I know we've talked about this a bunch. I, I don't think Wood is the long-term um, starter for the revolution. So, um, but, but they've lost a weapon with Barrero out on the wing, so it's going to be interesting to see if Rioni can kind of pick up the load uh, and, and take that weight off of their shoulders. Um, also curious if we see Latif Blessing move out to the wing too. Uh, maybe you go Ima Botang on the left and Blessing on the right, and maybe you put Bo up top. Um, there's, a, there's a handful of things they could do. Esmir might see some more time here um, on the right side as well. It'll be interesting. There's a, a lot of different ways they can do this, but I think short term, I think what they've been doing is working out just fine. And I think Ima Boateng has earned some minutes here. So uh, maybe there's just a like for like change here and they put him on the left. Um, maybe they, they just put Esmir in. I thought Esmir had a pretty solid game tonight. Um, I, I don't think Bruce is one to completely rework everything over one player over in one week. Um, but I'm sure as the season goes on, there'll be a lot more tweaks and fixes as it goes on. Oh, actually, we got one more question here uh, from Lexi on Twitter. Just this minute, it's likely that Barrera will be out a while. Unfortunately, 
will need to sign a replacement. Who are your top picks? Again, we're talking summer transfer window, which is not for a while. Um, anyone come to mind, Sean, in terms of who the Revolution can get? They can't get a U22 player. I believe if they put them on the season-ending injury list, maybe that opens up a U22 spot. I'd have to double-check that. But there's no designated players available. I'm not sure what the TAM situation is. Um, but, I mean, anyone come to mind? And, and do you think that they're going to be going out and getting someone to replace Burrow in summer w- window? I mean, not immediately. I think it's, it's, maybe you look at loan options for short-term loans to get somebody over in Europe that's not getting a lot of playing time that you can bring in to get playing time. But this is this is a tough question to answer when we're doing the podcast right after the show. If I had more time, it would be something I'd uh, spend more time looking into. But no, immediately no no name comes to mind. It is going to be a, a, a tough because they don't have that much room to play around with as far as salary cap space, I'm assuming, based on you know what we know. So it's it's going to be a tough one. Uh, we got a nomination already. Boy, the it, the injury hasn't even di- diagnosed yet. I liked how uh, these things move fast. Uh, G-Revs TV on Twitter uh, wants Egyptian right wing Ahmad Syed Zizzo. I do not know him, um, but he's got a thread on Twitter that is detailing why the Revs should go sign him. He's apparently a star in the Egyptian Premier League. I don't know how serious this is. I have never watched this player play, but go to G-Revs TV on Twitter and see his analysis of this player. I'm not sure if uh, what the re- reality of him getting th- that is, but again, we're talking summer transfer window, so Bruce is going to have to piece together for the next two months one way or the other. So, um, Sean, you want to talk about the referee in this game? Uh, j- I just want to quickly clarify something you brought up earlier, though, just because I think it is important. If So if a player is placed on the season-ending injury list, if that player is a designated player, Burrow is not, but I assume this would apply to the U22 initiative as well, the club may replace such player with a designated player, providing their salary budget charge is not more than the player he's replacing. So I don't see that same comments about the U22 initiative, but I can't imagine that would be treated differently, right? If they, if so, I'd assume that if Barrero is placed in the season-ending injury list, and again, it feels wrong speculating too much about this when we, the injury just happened, um, that they would, I, I think, would be able to replace him with a guy with a similar salary. Of course, if you're doing that, you're, you probably don't want to sign a guy long term so that's maybe where a loan comes in uh because you'd assume Burrow will be back next year yes i mean i i my interpretation is that mls doesn't update the rules perfectly on their website because they assume no one follows it and it's all very dumb anyway so my guess is that the u22 initiative is relatively new and they just haven't gotten around to updating it or no one's noticed that they haven't updated it so i'd assume the rules for u22 and and designated players are the same and and i think that was actually a change for this year i don't think that was the case previously that if 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 a designated player got hurt you could replace him with a designated player if he was on the season and injury list i think i think that's actually one of the the 2023 changes which i think is a good change Mm -hmm. agreed um, before we complain about the refereeing in this game, let's get, let's get through the Barrero questions, um, and this tragedy, uh, of Barrero's injury. Um, also Alfred on Twitter, how do you feel about winger depth with Barrero and without, uh, and then he also says, should the Revs make a splash in the tremor, tr- summer transfer window at winger, assuming would have to be with Tam. I would assume it would have to be with Tam. We've already mentioned U22. We're not sure if you can use U22 initiative spot. Oh, there's. I mean, when Barrero would come back, you'd have two U twenty two spots, right? I guess that you could, if you had a designated player leave, you could have another U twenty two spot open up. And and Bo's contract is up, and I'm guessing he's not back, at least not as a DP. But who knows? Maybe he will be. But you might trap yourself into having two U twenty two players, and then you then wouldn't be able to use a designated player spot. I know we're getting into nerd talk now, but for the listeners that don't know, if you have th- basically, I'll. I'll, I'll mile high view if you have three designated players signed you can have one u22 player if you have two u uh, designated players signed one or two you can sign three u22 players and i think it's if you have one young designated player and two normal designated players you can sign three u22 players so if you right. signed a second u22 player you're then potentially preventing yourself from getting a designated player next winter which and, and if you have overlap between barrero and and the new U22 player, that might cause some conflict when Barrero comes back, um, unless you could just put one on the right and one on the left. But um, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't think they'd use a U22 slot. They've used their DPs. So I think if you're going out and using, getting a summer transfer, it's going to be with Tam. I think that's going to be what's going to happen there. Or you're going to trade for someone within the league. Um, in terms of how do I feel, uh, the other thing too is that the Revs have some time. Bef- they can assess the team in-house before 
making this judgment. So if the revs start to slide, I think they're going to have to go out and figure out a way to replace Dylan Barrero. But if Ima Boateng slides in, it looks perfectly fine. I think Bruce is going to just ride it out. That's kind of my assessment. Um, so I think, will they make a splash in the summer to replace him? I think that's a big TBD because they're a little limited there um, with their top of the roster spots. Um, how do I feel about winger depth with Barrero and without? I feel a lot better with it. Um, I, I don't feel great w- with this depth without him. Nacho Heal is, I, I don't know where he is. Um, we're going to play Gustavo Bo on the wing. Esmir is okay. Esmir's fine. He's still growing. Um, Jack P still growing. Um, and then Ema looks great, but who knows when the last time he was a full-time starter. I don't know if we're going to get those performances consistently in in and out. Um, although I, I feel a lot better about it after watching tonight. So I don't feel great about the depth at winger right now. I mean, I, I didn't feel great about the depth at winger before Barrero got hurt. Uh, I feel a lot worse about it now. Uh, you know, part part of the depth is getting the young guys up to speed and, and, and seeing where they're at. And if Esmir can really take a step up, you know, you feel better about the depth. If, if Noel Buck was, I mean, Noel Buck, I think has firmly found himself as a central midfielder. So I'd prefer to see him stay there. Um, you know, if, if Jack P can, can show up on the wings, you know, it's it's a lot of dependent on that. And it was dependent on that before Barrero got hurt anyways. Uh, but yeah, we don't know what we're getting from Nacho Hill with his injury. We don't know what player he's going to come back as when he's been out this long. So there's plenty of questions there. And Tommy McNamara, uh, we've seen him play on the wings. I don't think anyone is too excited about that prospect is at this point in his career. I'd rather see him as a you know, depth piece as a central midfielder. Um, but, you know, no, with, uh, with Dylan Barrero out, there's a lot of questions on the wing. And it, you know, outside of Ima Boateng, there's no one that I'm confident you can count on at this point. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of the diamond uh, as we get into the summer months. But as I say, there'll be some time between now and when a decision has to be made. Um, we are maybe two and a half hours away from uh, Brero going down. Um, so it's, it's certainly not a great situation because I feel like Brero might be outside of Carlos Hill and, and Petro. I, I think he's by far the most difficult player to replace for the revolution. So this is going to be a very, very tough uh, couple of weeks and how the revolution adjusts. So uh, Traeger Durati, uh says, uh, and this is coming from his brother-in-law, Steve. He says, why don't the fans band together and protest the, ter- the turf? Uh, players are getting hurt. Do something. Uh, and we also did get another comment that um, from Teal Forever, do the revs get more injured than any other teams? Uh, do the revs get injured more than other teams or is soccer just a hard sport? The injuries have been piling up lately, Sean. Um, so yeah, it, one, do fans need to protest the turf and two, uh, is, are the revs just super unlucky or is this just soccer? It does seem like the revs have been particularly unlucky the past two seasons. It, you know, it, it, in some ways, you know, some of the things you, you have to blame on, well, it's a combination of things, right? It, in some ways the, you, the turf I think is a problem. Um, but it's also, there's some older guys in this team that have injury histories, uh, that, that, that's part of the issue. Um, Barrero's had a, several injuries in his career already. Uh, that's troubling. Um, so it, it's a, it's a whole factor of things, but it does seem like the revs have been particularly hit hard by the injury bug. As far as protesting the turf, I don't think that would, that would do the revs any good. I, I don't think it's going anywhere unless the NFL decides and the NFL has come out against turf. I think that if the players union has anyways, unless the NFL decides that, you know, teams aren't going to use turf anymore. I don't think, I don't think the revs are going to switch, uh, outside of the world cup. So, uh, you can protest all you want, but I don't think it's changing, unfortunately for the revolution until the Patriots demand that it changes. Um, with, with that said though, I think you can't blame everything on the turf. I mean, Henry Kessler got injured in, in DC. That's not turf there. A lot of these guys have gotten injured in training and the revs generally don't train on turf. So it's, I, I don't know that the turf is necessarily as big of a culprit as we'd like to make it be excuse. You know, in this one, when you see a guy like Dylan Burrow go down with the, the knee injury, it's hard not to think of the turf. But a lot of the injuries the Revs have this year, I think, have nothing to do with the turf. I, I will say, I, I, I think a fan protest wouldn't do anything, too. I don't think Kraft. It's it's 1030 on Saturday. I, I don't even know if uh, Robert Kraft knows that Dylan Burrow is out yet. Um, you know, he's, he's probably still going over the Patriot draft picks. Um, I, I do wonder, though. If Robert Kraft gets a note on Monday or tomorrow or whenever, and he learns that Dylan Barrero, who was projected to be a $10 million player, has torn his ACL, because this is going to ha- this is going to cost the revolution in the long term. Um, if Barrero never regains his form or if he has to stay back a year or something like that, you know, he is a very valuable asset to Robert Kraft and the New England Revolution in the form of he's going to be 
you know, a Tejan Buchanan like transfer. By the way, Tejan Buchanan might be going to Inter Milan for 15 to 20 million euros. 10% of that is coming back Robert Kraft's way um, in the New England Revolution's way. So when you have a similar player who's got a sparkling future, tears his ACL, I wonder if that makes Robert Kraft think a little bit and wonder if there needs to be a, you know, a switch to grass when the Patriots aren't playing. Um, Cause I can't imagine, I mean, I, I don't know what the cost of replacing the turf in the summer is, but I can't imagine it is more than, you know, with a value lost on a, a $10 million player tearing his ACL. If, if Barrero ends up being sold for three or 4 million in a couple of years, um, I mean, we're, we're talking about a, a pretty major asset that's been uh, lost. Now, it's a it's a much more complex conversation than that because there's concerts and there's other events at Gillette Stadium and the Revs aren't the only people in there. So I'm sure it's very, very unrealistic. But I wonder if Robert Kraft kind of looks at the situation and realizes um, that it, long term, the revolution on turf isn't a great fit. Yeah, I, you know, I think we've said it for years that it'd be great to see that happen. Um, to see them go back to grass, but it, it just doesn't seem like, you know, it, will, will this be something that triggers Bob Kraft? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, there's been ACL injuries that have happened on grass too. So there's plenty of ways you can look the other way on it. Yeah. Um, Sean, you know, one thing we can't look the other way on is the incredible value you get from our sponsor, Glasso Kits. Their mission is to bring unique vintage jerseys to your home with a catalog of jerseys, jackets, scarves, and more from clubs and national teams from over 80 countries in the world. Go check out GalassoKits.com today for their full selection and make sure you follow them at Galasso Kits on Twitter and on Instagram at Galasso Kits for updates on their new inventory. And if you follow them on Instagram, you probably already saw that in this week's unboxing video, they have a mint condition, adult large Providence city, 2019 kit available right now. That isn't lasting long. Someone's going to snatch it up and someone is going to snatch it up using promo code revs recap and save 15% off of that sweet kit. So if you want that to be you, I would go to glassokits.com right now and use promo code revs recap to save 15% off your order on that Providence city FC kit or anything else in their store. Again, promo code revs recap at glassokits.com com for 15 percent off your order links and code are in the show notes sean let's complain about refereeing i want to complain about refereeing we haven't gotten there yet i've been waiting all all episode to complain about refereeing terrible as great as this match was this was a terrible referee um i'll let you i'll give the floor to you and then i'll i'll fill in the gaps if you missed anything it, to me it's it's more about what 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 is the point of var right i i don't understand in the first instance where it seemed like justin Rennix, i think it was a handball it was unfortunate i don't blame him too much but his hand was away from his body it, still probably a natural position but I, I think i think that's a handball but it happened outside the box from what it looked like to me on tv i don't know why the referee doesn't get the chance to at least go back and, and look at it on the monitor why var doesn't have him go take a look you know maybe it's not clear and obvious at the end of the day when he goes and looks at it but it to me it, that looked like it happened outside of the box so that was a, v- a very harsh call fortunately it didn't come back to hurt the revs because you know petrovic made the save although they did concede not too long after on a corner kick um but so that you know that was the first one and then there was you know a couple of shouts for chances for the revolution um i think there's a couple of different cards that could have been given out too uh, so it just wasn't a great refereeing situation and then of course late in the game there's the potential penalty kick on andrew Fowl farrell that I, I i'm still not sure I, I had a good enough angle of that one to to tell whether or not that could have been a penalty kick but the revolution were lucky to kind of avoid one there um so it was just a difficult refereed game for the revolution ac- across the board uh, i think they were lucky that some of the calls didn't come to hurt them more than they did because georgie petrovic is so good Mm-hmm. And there's another call, too, where Justin Renex is pulled down, I believe, by Nick Hagelin. There's a long ball over the top. Renex kind of ball bounces by him. He's running by him, and he gets pulled down. No card. No card on that play. I have no idea how there's no yellow card um, on Justin Renex beating a defender and getting in behind him and being pulled down. Um, the the handball on Renex, I think that's unlucky on Renex. He looks very outside the box. I do not know. I guess they didn't go to VAR. It's inconclusive. I feel like inconclusive does a lot of heavy lifting here for the refereeing and pro. Um, and also, we got a, a comment here from Derek. The foul for the penalty looked like it was actually outside of the box from where I was sitting in the fort. Good thing Petro saved it anyway. Thoughts on that call? I, Sean, I think you're in agreement with me. I mean, he, he looks like he's almost a body length outside of the the penalty area. 
I guess it's just there wasn't a good enough angle to show the hand outside of the the line. But I mean, his, yeah, his, his hand would have to be fully bo- extended. His body was one hundred percent outside of the penalty area. It was, it's just a question of was he leaning back in his, you know, I, it, to me, it looked like he was almost certainly outside of the penalty area, but there was the slightest bit of gray. I guess you could you could say if to say it was inconclusive. Now, I, I will say, Pro does release these videos and they show the process of of the VAR officials doing this. So I do appreciate the transparency and I find it very interesting, but I do not know. I mean, I, 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 he's almost like two steps outside of the box. I don't understand how anyone, I guess it's just inconclusive, but again, it it seems like, oh man, it it just was so clearly outside the box to me. Um, And then you're right. Andrew Farrell, I guess they said on the Apple, Apple TV, the commentators on Apple TV said that he called for a penalty kick and then he switched it. Apparently, he was always calling for a goal kick. Um, apparently, the, the commentators got that wrong, which made a little bit more sense because I don't know why you'd not why you take away a penalty kick call um, by yourself. Um, but I, I mean, what's going to replay? That was the most obvious penalty kick I feel like of the season. I mean, it was a, he didn't get any of the ball. He took out the plant leg from Acosta. How is that not a penalty kick? I think I think the only argument is that you, at least on the replay, is that I couldn't tell with one hundred percent certainty that, that he it wasn't a dive. Yeah, that, some people speculated that Acosta dived, but Farrell still makes contact. I, I I don't know. I don't understand how VAR is working. This is it. It was ridiculous. So I guess we should be happy. I guess the uh, you know the, there was a makeup call there at the end. Either way, there was one penalty kick that uh, should have been gone against the Revs, and and Petra made a penalty kick save. So maybe it all works out in the end. Um, but I thought there was a, a terrible refereed game. Um, uh, Ryan uh, says on Twitter, it was a great game for sure, but refereeing was all over the place. Absolutely. Um, and also TSB11 says, how long until uh, Chilowitz's mandatory vacation from pro after this outing? Um, pretty terrible. Just a terrible, terrible game. Thought it was inconsistent. If you want to talk about missed yellow cards, I thought Mascara could have had a couple of yellow cards in this one for, for, for I think, stomping on Andrew Farrell at one point or hit, catching him with his cleats, yeah. um, kind of an ankle. That was pretty bad. Yep. And I and I do think there was some contact with Burrow when Burrow was injured where his, his second leg came through extremely high. I don't, I don't know that that's what's caused the injury, but his, his second leg, I thought, hit him near the knee and came through extremely high. And I think he was you know lucky that he didn't get a yellow card in that play. I don't think you'd go to VAR and call that a red. Uh, but I think that could have been a yellow card. He could have gotten a yellow card in Farrell. And I think he got the benefit of the doubt uh, with his elbow being high on, on Carly's heel late in the game. So there's, there's a guy that was very fortunate not to end up in the book. Yeah, not great. Uh, Sean, who else impressed you in this game? A lot of players impressed me in this game. I like just going through the list. I, I thought Buck and Polster, the two of them together, played fantastic. Uh, really good job of knowing kind of when to stay back and when to get forward. And both of them contributed on both ends of the field. Polster offensively showed a side of his game that we don't always see. Kim just combining with guys in the offensive third. I, I was really impressed with the two, the two of them. But um, you know, everybody across the board. We talked about Boateng. Dave Romney had a phenomenal game. You know, he was he made several key blocks. He was always in the right spot. Andrew Farrell, maybe other than the penalty kick, I thought he he played pretty well. There was that play where he was beat by Acosta. Um, Brandon Bay, I thought, had a really good game. His passing accuracy was only 47%, so that was a little bit troubling. But otherwise, I thought he had a, a fantastic game. Obviously got the assist. Um, you know, Carles Hill it was his typical self, played really, really well, connecting with everybody. There's there's not a lot of players that I don't look at as having <laughs> in this game and, and uh, can't say they played really, really well. Obviously, Petrovic, fantastic on the penalty kick save and also had several other key saves. So you know, maybe other than Justin Rennicks, who uh, didn't necessarily have the best game, but at the same time, you know, you mentioned that yellow card he got on Miazga and the yellow card he should have gotten on Hagelin. He's he still had a couple of, of good plays. Uh, but o- overall, the, <laughs> I, think, I think you can point to any player on the pitch and the revs and say they played really well. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with all that. I think Brandon Bay had a phenomenal game, too. Um, you know, he, he had a, the assist on the Ima Boateng goal. Um, he, um, had a cross in that led to the Ima Boateng double chance at the end of uh, the second half. Uh, there was one play where Petro makes a phenomenal, phenomenal save. I think it was on Santos from point blank range, basically. And by is able to tip the rebound up in the air and that kind of clears the ball out momentarily. Um, there was also a time where Acosta is one-on-one with Brandon by and Brandon by essentially holds him up, slows him down, blocks the path to goal, doesn't allow a shot uh, and, and, 
is able to stall enough for Andrew Farrell and other defenders to come back uh, and, and stop the play. And Acosta has to pass the ball out. There's kind of a miscommunication. The ball goes out for a goal kick. So it, it was a one-on-one chance uh, against Acosta. Didn't lead to a, a, cha- a shot from FC Cincinnati. So I thought that was a great play. So I think this was a pretty good game for Brandon By um, overall. Um Polster is one I'll disagree with you a little bit. I think he played fine, but there were a couple of passes that, um, and maybe it was the condition, maybe the ball just wasn't moving too fast today, but um, just just a couple of turnovers. There's one play in particular in the 72nd minute. Dewan Jones crosses the ball back to him. He heads it for some reason, turns the ball over there in the midfield. Um, he seemed to play fine. We did get a comment from uh, Teal Forever. He says, I like the Buck and Polster in the field together. Do you see a future there? Um, I'm, I'm curious to see Buck and Blessing. Um, I, I think Buck does a lot on both sides of the ball. I think he could fill into that Polster role, and, and I'm sure that he's more of an 8 than a 6, but I think if you're going with a 4-4-2 or a 4-2-3-1, um, I, I don't know. I think Buck can certainly handle some defensive duties and maybe step in for Polster when Blessing comes back, but um, I wasn't too high on Polster this game. This is the only one I'll disagree with you on. I think all those players that you mentioned had great games. Petrovic had a phenomenal game again. I don't think we need to go too heavy into it. Penalty kick save. Um, saved a long-range blast from Vasquez um, in the 36th minute. Point-blank save on um, Santos. Uh, only time, only mistake really from him is that there's one moment in the 34th minute where he comes out of net. Santos is able to get around him, and I believe Andrew Farrell is able to clear the ball out. Um, outside of that, not a whole lot to complain about. We could get into Justin Reddick. You want to? Well, well, why don't we get into Justin Reddick? Oh, actually, wait. Before I do that, Noel Buck, great game. I think I already talked about his uh, long ball over the top to Ian Botang. Phenomenal stuff. This guy doesn't look like an eighteen-year-old. He he looks like a phenomenal player. He he could start for any team in MLS. I mean, he's a great. Uh, I, I can't say enough great things about Noel Buck. Um, I, I I feel like he should honestly be playing every single game. Um, but Justin Reddick, um, did you want? I, did you want to talk about Justin Reddick anymore? I think you feel like you made your opinions known. No, I, th- I think it's it's worth bringing it up because he was he kind of forced into action in this game because they didn't really have any other options given the injuries. And it's just, uh, you know, as a tough spot for him to be in, especially playing as a lone striker, I don't think that's a good role for him. The effort was there, um, but the passing in particular was one thing that stood out to me. We'd get the ball and the, the passes, yes, she was just poor. He wasn't on the same page with teammates at times. Uh, again, effort was there. He won some key fouls. But just not good enough to play that lone number nine striker role, and that was was something I think we knew going into this game, and was you know pretty obvious in this game. Um, I think I like him in the role off the bench where he's you know, play, maybe playing on the wing or just coming on to you know to to run hard late in the game. But I I, I think we know at this point that he's not kind of a solo number nine in any, in any case. Mm -hmm. And I think he does a lot of little things right, and he's a grinder. Um, And you're right. I think that the role for him is you're up 1-0. You're pulling, I'll say, Vrioni or Bo off, and you're putting in Justin Rennex to press, to win balls, to to keep the ball down in the attacking third, um, to rely on Justin Rennex as a lone striker to score is a tough ask. Um, I feel like at the very least he needs to be in a two-striker situation. He needs some help up top there. uh, obviously he got called for the handball there. I think that was a little bit of bad luck, but even when he's winning long direct balls, there were so many times he seemed like he'd carry the ball into a corner and he didn't know where to go with it or he, he'd lose the ball. At one point he loses the ball, goes out for a throw in. At one point he just kind of stalls. And then I think uh, Gaddis goes down and just takes the ball off of him. Um, there's one play in particular in the first half, Carlos Hill has a nice little low through ball right into him and, Really, it should have been a chance right on target. And Rennix doesn't really have the speed to get there, and he doesn't get the angle right. And so he ends up holding the ball. I think he's trying to pass back to Esmir. This must have been when Barrera was off. I think he's passing back to Esmir, and he turns the ball over. Um, he's just not a deadly player. Um, I think he's a maybe a winger, a winger striker, depth player who kind of comes in, presses, does the grinding work. But if you need a goal, you know, God help you if Justin Rennix is your lone striker out there. So, um, I, I think he's a depth piece at best at this stage. Um, tough game for him. I, I'd say this was a tough game for him, much better in the U.S. Open Cup. Um, also, we got a comment from Mike Kennedy. Thought Buck and Polster both did a great job of controlling the tempo, winning second balls in the middle of the park, and keeping Cincy forwards disjointed and starved of opportunities. I think I'm in the minority opinion on Polster here. I, I think I, I, uh, I'm the only person here uh, that didn't like Polster here tonight. So, um, 
oh, we got one more, uh, comment here from Traeger. By the way, we're doing this as com- comments are coming in, so I apologize for the disjointedness of this. But Traeger says, from his nephew, uh, do you think we would have done better if we started Bo over Renix? Um, God bless his nephew. Uh, I think this is some great analysis from his nephew here. Uh, I, I, if if I Thomas is his name, I, I think Thomas wanted to start Gustavo Bo over Justin Renix. I, I I think Thomas is pretty sharp, don't you think, Sean? Yeah, I think I think if uh, Gustavo Bo was ready to start and they had started him, they would have been a lot better off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paulo says I, I thought Ima by Petro and Buck had the best performances. I think so. Maybe Heel is in there. I feel like we always skip over Carlos Heel and, and we don't talk about how amazing Carlos Heel is because uh, we just expect it at that point. But those four, uh, I think, certainly stood out with great performances. Uh, with Polster, probably the worst, uh, but uh, was an overall good team performances. Wood did not look 100% clearly. Look, we got one in the, the Polster didn't have a great game. Uh, camp is me. Um, I'll, I, I, Bobby Wood, let's talk Bobby Wood. Um, seemed really out of it, didn't he? I mean, he d- yeah, it wasn't his best performance but he didn't i don't know i don't know he <laughs> at part of it he's just not 100 percent. i think i think that was pretty clear but he made he made some good runs i'll give him that it just wasn't did the finishing touch and the ability to kind of beat the defender to the ball wasn't there no at one point everyone was looking for a penalty call he kind of falls down in the box and i think he just kind of got up he wasn't looking for a call the crowd reacted to it but i think he slipped on the the turf so i wonder if he was having a tough time with the turf um I don't know. He he seemed to have a really really tough time uh, connecting with players, and that didn't seem to be an issue before he was out. So um, curious to see. I mean, I guess it depends on Vrioni's injury situation. Uh, I, boy, so they have Bo Wood working their way back from injury. Vrioni is out, and then you have Justin Renix there, and you have Josie who's still out. The forward position is just an absolute mess. Who knows what's going to happen next week? Um, but if Wood gets in there, it'll be interesting to see if he, he how he does on extended minutes. So. Well, it's it's crazy that Justin Renix is fifth on the striker depth chart, and he was the only one ready to start this game. That's that's uh, that's really well bad luck. But at the same time, you have a pretty old forward depth chart outside of Rioni and and Renix. Um, and I guess having the injury history when you, when, you know, when you talk about bad luck, you talk about injury histories. You, you also have to say. You know, guys like Bobby Wood have long injury histories. Josie Altador has long injuries. Gustavo Bo has had a lot of injuries lately, and he's 33. So there is that aspect of it, too, when you're looking at the revolution, that there are some guys on this team that had injury histories before they came to the Revs, too. That doesn't make it that surprising when they come here and they aren't healthy for every game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Traeger's got one more question here. This one's from him, not from his nephew. Uh, but he says, seeing the crowd filled with scarves during the walkout was beautiful. What would you do to make this a consistent scene at Gillette? was a great crowd tonight 30,000 in attendance to this game usually when there's 30,000 in attendance it's usually a terrible game it's usually a game where the revs have their heart ripped out in the last minute not tonight one one draw still not a win um, but I think uh, a lot of fans got some entertaining soccer uh, Sean what would you do to make these crowds more consistent at Gillette Stadium <laughs> that's the uh, million dollar question isn't it I think I think this was a game where they had a youth soccer night um, at least from what I was seeing that, you know, there was anytime there's youth soccer night, they do pretty well when they go out there and do those promotions. Um, but no, it was, it was a really good crowd. You could hear them on the TV broadcast. You know, <laughs> that's the million dollar question. What can you do to have this every night? And I think the way to have this every night is to build a stadium in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that that's, you, you can dream. Um, I, I don't know if putting a, everyone says winning a trophy and putting a winning product out there. The Reds are doing that. Um, and I, I, I wonder, I'd have to go back and look at the attendance bump in 2021. It'll be hard to do with COVID. Um, it does seem like the crowds are a little bit better this year. I know that there have been some bad weather games. You can never really tell from March, April, but I think now that we're getting into May, 30,000 in May, I don't ever recall them doing that. There's usually the 30,000 games are happening in August and September. And so I wonder if with the success of 2021, and good soccer being played in 2023, I wonder if this is leading to an uptick in attendance. Um, but I'm, I'm curious. It'll be interesting to see if this is a long-term thing. I know they passed out a million tickets. I know they do that every – every team does that. Every team that passes out a million tickets to youth soccer teams. Um, I, I wonder if this is going to be – if there's going to be more 30,000 games this season. Because um, there's normally one or two uh, in a year, but it seems pretty early for this to be one of them. Yeah, technically still April, so don't get ahead of ourselves and call it May. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That does it for listener questions. Sean, uh, let's talk about Brioni, out due to injury. Um, I I was going to – 
I, I wasn't on the show last week. So I wanted to talk about the Vrioni hype train. Um, do you do you have any thoughts on Vrioni before I take over and, and get on my soapbox about his injury or about his form or anything like that? I'll, I'll let you go first. Okay. I, I, look, and I, I've, I've given mixed reviews on Vrioni so far, but I think one thing that, that people – everyone kind of came out and said he hasn't done anything. He's hurt. He's, he's not going to fill this designated player billing, you know – the Buxa comparisons of, you know, Buxa didn't do much in year one, which wasn't really, it's not 100% true. But, you know, there there was kind of a counter like, wait, we need to wait on him because Buxa struggled in year one and then he came out of the woodwork. Brioni has scored three goals since I've been on the show last. And suddenly people have decided, I've seen people say, Brioni is going to be, you know, he's going to lead the team in goals this season. He's better than Buxa. He's the man. He scored a brace. He scored a brace against Kansas City. Oh my God. In the same way that you can't judge Vrioni for not playing enough or not scoring enough when he's out or when he's getting substitute appearances, you can't point to one brace and and say this is the guy. There's still a small sample size here. I think we're dealing with 580 minutes of Vrioni from from the New England Revolution. I I I, I am amazed at how impressed people are from Vrioni. I think he's going to be better than Bobby Wood. I think he's, at this stage, I think he's an MLS starter. Is he an all-star? I don't know. Is he a $10 million player in two years? I don't know. I think a lot of people are overreacting to the Sporting Kansas City break uh, brace, and I, I, I think he's making better runs. I think he's growing, but there still needs to be a lot of steps made to get him in the right direction. Um, I, I, I'm not sold on his aerial ability, Four of his 19 goals in Austria were from headers, and this team relies on headers. Adam Buxa was great on headers. Um, I, I, I think a lot of people are really trying to force that Brioni buxa comparison in there. Hopefully he, he picks up. I, I'm still not sold that this is a 15-goal-a-year guy. I think this is more a 10-goal-a-year guy. Um, still a very small sample size, though, so you know it's very tough to make that assessment, but... I think a lot of people are very, very impressed with Frioni, um, and they're making the same mistake that the people who weren't impressed with Frioni were making prior to the Sporting Kansas City game. So that's my soapbox. Still still 600 minutes from Frioni. He's started five games in Major League Soccer. We really don't know what we have here. Um, hopefully he works out, but man, I, I, I cannot believe how many people are sold on Frioni after one game against Sporting Kansas City. Done. Rant over. Go. Hey, I, I mean, I think there's plenty of reasons to be hopeful about him after the scoring three goals, which is which is much more that could be said than early on. But the, there's the big question for me is that I still don't know how he fits in with this team when everyone's healthy, because it, it's clear to me that Gustavo Bo plays better when he's next to a striker that's a holdup striker, and Rioni d- doesn't show to be that player. Both him. And Gustavo Bo look like they're at their best facing the goal and not at their best when their back's the goal. And I, I think Bobby Wood is a guy that complements Gustavo Bo better because he's more capable of being that hold-up striker, even though Brioni, I think, is a more talented player and capable of scoring a lot more goals. So uh, there's a lot to be excited about, or a lot to be hopeful about, rather, with Brioni from what we've seen recently. But uh, there's still that question remains of how, how this team fits when everyone's healthy, because I'm not sure that Brioni and Bo are the best combination. Um, and you know, b- besides everything else, you talk about the injuries. We were told that he was out from this game as a precaution. That's nothing serious. Of course, we were also told that Henry Kessler was pulled from a game as a precaution. So you can't take, <laughs> take that with a grain of salt. Um, but that's another issue when it comes to Brioni's. He does have somewhat lengthy injury history at this point, both with the Revs and before the Revs. And, you know, if, if he does become that player that can be a, if healthy, 15 goal scorer, he's got to be healthy. And we're not, we're not sure that we can have him healthy for a full season yet based on what we've seen. Mm-hmm. Talk to me in a thousand minutes and then we'll go from there. I, uh, and, and to be fair to him, a lot of his appearances have been, he's had more substitute appearances than starts in major league soccer. And it's really tough to judge someone off of that you're getting into the flow of a game you know you're not getting 90 minutes at a time you're getting 20 minutes at a time so uh, yeah I, I i hopefully he is healthy hopefully we get a solid 2023 out of rioni um i'm still not 100 percent sold on him still not 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 out on him not out on him but I, I still think we need to see a lot more from rioni than um that game against sporting kansas city um 
Can I rant about Adam Buxa? <laughs> sure. He's not coming back. We need to kill this. There's been a fake Twitter account that has said Adam Buxa is coming back. Taylor Twelman said on New England Soccer Weekly that two MLS teams are interested and Buxa was pushing back to come back to MLS. It sounds like he wants a loan move to get back fit. That's my assumption, at least. I don't think he wants a permanent transfer back to MLS. Um, Bruce was asked about it. He seemed surprised. The Revs have no right to Adam Buxa. When he was sold, the MLS rights to Adam Buxa have gone. Poof. He's not coming back to New England. He's not a fit in New England. Him and Vrioni are not a fit. Um, it, it would be way too many cooks in the kitchen, although none of our forwards can seem to be healthy, and we end up playing Justin Rennix uh, in a very important game against FC Cincinnati. So, I mean, maybe I'm wrong there. But I, I don't think he fits with Vrioni. Uh, I don't think you can bring in Buxa on a loan move and bench Vrioni because that would be damaging to Vrioni long-term. Um, he's not coming back. Let's just squash this. He's not coming back. Adam Buxa is gone. Sean, anything? Well, I, I, I agree with you. I did find the fact that Bruce Arena didn't just ignore when he was asked about it and said we would look into it as one of the things that would lead people to continue to think it's a possibility. But <laughs> with, with who the Revolution have on the roster and how the roster is structured right now, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. You know, Maybe in some pie in the sky scenario, if they moved on from Josie Altador and brought in books on a, on a short term loan deal. But like you said, that's going to really hurt Giacomo Vrioni long term. And he's the guy that's here to stay and books coming back for six months uh, you know, could be helpful for the revolution short term. But I, I, I'm with you. I, I can't really see a realistic scenario where that would happen. Mm hmm. It, it... It's also, to get into nerd technical salary talk, he's not necessarily a designated player if he comes back to MLS either, because if it's a loan and there's no fee attached, then really all you need to make sure he fits under is the salary. And as long as he's not being paid a salary under $1.65 million annualized, so for mid-year that'd be about $825,000, um, you could use TAM to buy them down to the maximum salary budget. So if he's making a million dollars or five hundred thousand over six months you know you could use gam or tam and buy him down a little bit and fit him into the salary cap so he's not necessarily a designated player i think some mls team is going to if buxa does actually want to come back benefit from this uh i don't think it's going to be the new england revolution i think the revolution have moved on to Vrioni, who again is not amazing is not crap we don't know yet because there's still a small sample size so let's calm down let's put away the jump to conclusion matt uh but adam books is not coming back we, we can jump to conclusions on that one. So, Sean. Oh, Tejon Buchanan. Inner, uh, not Inner Miami. Oh, inner Milan. <laughs> oh, that'd be a nightmare, wouldn't it? Oh, my God. Tejon Buchanan to Inter Milan. Looks like 15 to 20 million euros. Revs hold a 10% fee. I think I mentioned that earlier, but I'm going to say it again here just to wrap up. I think we're all done on news and notes. Sean, uh, anything else on your mind before you want to wrap up here tonight? No, it's just it was great to see a fantastic revolution performance in front of a, a large home crowd. Like you said, there's been so many times over the years where they've really put out does in front of a large home crowd. So ho hopefully that's the uh, key to, to getting those people to come back, uh, even though it was a draw, not a win. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to rant that if the Bruins blow this series, I don't I don't follow the Bruins during the regular season. I am a complete bandwagon fan when it comes to the Bruins. Um, and as someone who has been emotionally invested in the Bruins for roughly two weeks, I will be devastated if they blow this three to one lead to Florida. Um, I don't know much about the NHL, but I do know that the Florida Panthers are a joke franchise. Hockey in Florida is stupid. Um, and I've never in my life heard of the Florida Panthers having a half decent hockey team. Uh, I'm sure someone will send me a link of them winning the Stanley Cup or something, but every time I've ever heard of the Florida Panthers, they're kind of a joke. Uh, so this would be a complete, complete insult and uh, be very devastating to me if they lose to the Florida Panthers and blow a 3-1 to lead. Also, Tom Quinlan's stakes are crap, and uh, I'm tired of pretending that they're not. just want to speak my <laughs> truth. What, what's up with having a team named after a state when there's multiple teams in that state? I don't, I don't get that. That's true. Did did the Panthers precede the Tampa Bay Lightning? I mean, I have to. Uh, I, I'm just, obviously, I'm googling this as I make the comment. And Tampa Bay Lightning was 1992, and Florida Panthers was 1993. So that makes even less sense. Where are the Florida Panthers? Are they like Miami? Uh, they're like are they like Fort Lauderdale? They're not Miami. They're near. They're near Miami. They're Miami. They're Sunrise, Florida. There you go. So technically, Miami area. 
<laughs> yeah, even the Marlins changed over to Miami eventually. Uh, and the California Angels are the L.A., Anaheim, you know, San Diego Angels or whatever they're called now. So, yeah, even everyone else got the memo, but the Florida Panthers. It's because they're a joke franchise. <laughs> uh, the Bruins are definitely losing now that I'm trashing Florida Panthers, aren't they? Yep. Hmm. Well, before I curse <laughs> any other local sports teams, let's get out of here. Sean, where can people find you? You can follow me on Twitter at Sean L. Donahue. And you can follow us on Twitter at Revolution Recap. Be sure to follow our Revolution Recap Instagram and Facebook pages. Be sure to follow our friends at The Blazing Musket on Twitter at Blazing Musket. And go subscribe to their Substack. You can subscribe for free and get all of the news for the Revolution, for our Rhode Island FC, for Hartford Athletic, for Vermont Green. Uh, any other local soccer news comes straight to your email inbox. You don't have to go look for it. Go subscribe to their uh, Substack. That's the Blazing Musket. And uh, if you can, you are able to, you can uh, subscribe uh, for a paid option and support local soccer. Uh, and also, they also help out our podcast and make uh, additional content for us. We've been putting out additional second shows over the past few weeks. Hopefully, you guys have been liking that. So make sure you go support them at The Blazing Musket. Uh, also, be sure to follow our friends at The Rebellion on Twitter, at The Rebellion, and go to anyrebellion.org to learn more about them. Uh, and also, go check out our sponsor, Galasso Kits, and use promo code REVSRECAP at 15% off your order. Again, galassokits.com. Thank you to them. Uh, make sure you are subscribed on iTunes or wherever you're listening. And if you can rate and review us five stars, please do. It helps people looking for revolution content find us. We're not at 100 reviews yet. Haven't been on the show for three weeks. Told you guys to get us to 100 reviews. We're at 98. At 98. So I, I, I know a lot of you aren't reviewing. I just need two of you. Get us to 100. Get us to 100. I think my next show is in three weeks. Two weeks? Three weeks. Either way, get us to 100. I don't want to have this talk again, guys. Come on. Be better. Until next week, well, when uh, who are we playing next week, Sean? Toronto. Ooh, who, who got a win today? One nothing over New York City FC. Big win for them with CJ Sapong. CJ Sapong scoring in his debut. Ooh, that's going to be an interesting game. TFC, a bit of a sleeping giant. I think their record is like two wins, two losses, and like a billion draws. Uh, they're kind of like Nashville from a few years ago, where they're just drawing a ton. But I think they're going to be uh, making a late season run here. So home, home or away, Sean? Away. Ooh, it's going to be a tough one. All right. Well, the Revs are going to go up north to TFC. Hopefully they take three points without Dylan Burrow, without all the other players that get hurt in training this week. Uh, and when they do, we'll be back to talk about it. So thank you, everyone, for listening, and go Revs. <laughs>